colleagues, hello to everyone who's joining us um, for uh, this particular session and Oslo 3 uh, conference with a particular focus on building trust and social dialogue and the impact of local interventions. Um, uh, great that you've been able to join us. We're uh, joined by a wonderful panel. My name is Samuel Risk. I'm the head of conflict prevention, peace building, and responsive institutions at UNDP's Crisis Bureau. We're very closely with, uh, within our team on PVE with Oslo Governance with a number of colleagues. Are also with us on the, on the line today. Um, I'm very glad again that uh, that you can join and over the next hour we'll be hearing about some of these local interventions that build um, uh, trust and promote dialogue from a local perspective. Um, I, um, I want to mention a few things before we go ahead and start. I will not do long introductions for the colleagues. Uh, you will be able to see the bios uh, obviously online. Uh, but Ahmad, uh, Morton, uh, Hamas, um, um, Sato, and uh, Ruth, we might change a little bit the order to make sure we accommodate colleagues who are unable to join or had trouble uh, joining very quickly. Uh, but let me just uh, uh, open with a couple of um, uh, very quick ideas. The work that we are doing um, in the PDE portfolio basically now, you know, has jumped up from covering 30 to 35 countries to this year covering um, uh, a number of more countries, so 40 plus countries. Of the work that we are doing, there's the regional work, there's the national level work, and I think more and more we're trying to pull out some of the dividends that, propose, that promote trust um, dialogue uh, work from a lot of very good country experiences. A lot of those are happening with our partners. And secondly, to think about what comes next, I think the spirit of Oslo 3 certainly is about um, how to revisit the work that we are all jointly, collectively, individually doing on the prevention of violent extremism and to offer a perspective moving ahead, ahead on the lens of um, uh, innovation, um, and um, a new kind of programming that I think is important um, dealing with um, maybe new kinds of challenges that we have uh, now that we might not have seen as we first started working on this um, quite a long time ago, maybe a decade ago. So also one in 2015 or also two in 2018 uh, was looking at our agenda. Um, and uh, therefore looking at this innovation, artificial intelligence, behavioral insights, particular engagements that promote social cohesion, trust, prevention, relinking the PVE and strong relinking the PVE to the prevention, sustaining peace agenda. All of that I think is on the table uh, uh, as well. Um, there are a number of, uh, a, a number of tools uh, that have now come into play just over the last one or two years to better monitor and measure our collective impact Impact, better risk manage uh, the work that we do. And I think more and more as we move ahead, we're looking at digital transformation uh, in the land of PPE, the role of the media, social media, hate speech, and other, and how this promotes or undermines a lot of social, um, social trust and, um, and um, uh, solidarity and engagement. Um, and then I think one of the things that I'll speak about a little bit more maybe as we close is how we are looking more and more towards using some particular tools to promote more community engagement. Uh, are we in need of more tools and guidance? Et um, what uh, is on the radar for us and how can we do more, uh, more of that um, uh, work? Uh, I think I say this here in particular in relation to how community engagement um, uh, really promotes uh, dialogue among who and with who, uh, and how do we do that? How do we link local level to national level to maybe global level advocacy on PVE continues to be an important priority um, as we move ahead. Let me um, stop here. Maybe I'll come back with a couple of ideas uh, more on um, impact and local interventions. Uh, but instead of speaking more, very much look forward over the next 52 minutes um, to hearing from colleagues who are joining us on this particular uh, panel. Uh, let's start with Ahmed Mohammadi, analyst and assistant professor of inter at the International Institute for Islamic Thought and Civilization. Um, uh, uh, Ahmad, can we go to you for uh, maybe a couple of uh, uh, opening words uh, uh, to begin? Um, on uh, where you see the discussion um, uh, moving forward on social uh, impact, social trust, social dialogue um, at uh, the local level. 
from your own research? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Sam. Uh, uh, my co-panelists, Morton, um, uh, Ruth, and uh, Hamsatu. Um, first and foremost, let me <clears throat> thank the United Nations Development Programs, uh, the Governance uh, Center at Oslo for inviting me to share the thought here in this discussion. Um, from my point of view, I would say <clears throat> Definitely, we admit that the we have the, the trust deficit, which is taking place uh, today, especially this uh, during COVID nineteen pandemic. Um, but uh, I believe that the <clears throat> the role of analysis, the role of analysts, the researchers, and the think tank of civil society are very critical in providing the accurate, uh, evidence based uh, uh, information. Uh, to the public, and uh, this role is very critical because um, the independent researcher, for example, or analysts, they are actually sitting in between, in one hand, the state, the government, and the other hand is the, the public. So they are not to be seen or they're not being perceived as the part of the state, and they're also actually able to provide uh, evidence-based information. I think that is the first point. The second point, the, the biggest challenge would be how to maintain this independence, especially in providing the analysis and also the public perception, because sometimes the public perception, they would view um, those people who are working closely with the state as somebody who is not purely um, independent in that sense. So the challenge would be maintaining uh, the independence in terms of analysis and the public perceptions uh, to um, <clears throat> to provide the analysis uh, for the public. And the third point I would like to mention is um, we, we have to remember we are living in the age of globalization, uh, in the age of information and technology. Everybody have the access to the internet, uh, to the information, the information at the fingertips. And uh, because of this, that the state is no longer hold the monopoly to information. Uh, everybody uh, become like uh, the citizen uh, journalism. They can practice that. So the choice of for the choice or the source of information, we have a multiple source of information these days. So these are the reality that we have to admit. However, I do not say that the role of the state in terms of providing the uh, source of information is, is not important, it's still important. They can play that, that role. And uh, the last point I would like to mention is that what is the way forward then? Since we have like uh, everybody having access to information and the government is no longer seen to be providing <coughs> reliable information to the public, what is the way forward? I think the way forward would be, I mean, at least in my case, we have to leverage on the collaboration between independent researcher or analyst um, with the state, with the government. I think uh, they have the both strength. Everybody has their strength and we have to leverage on that. I mean, in, in my case, for example, uh, we have seen in the past many years that United Nations Development Program, for example, has been assisting militia a lot in terms of providing support training uh, to the local actors on the ground. And this, this sustainable uh, assistant has been working very well. And sometimes it's also provide as the motivation for us here uh, to work harder because there are support coming in. So whenever we have like in one hand the support from the outside and the local actors will also have their strength of their own and we're working together with this, we can produce a wonderful result. And uh, another thing that is also important that different locality need different messenger uh, and different narrative so the only person the only people who know uh, who are the best messenger because we just finished uh, one study in malaysia recently we found out that different locality need different messenger and different narrative so i think this is something that i want to share with you to begin with. thank you Uh, thank you very much, uh, Ahmed. I think the last point that you concluded with is really quite important. Uh, there's a little bit of a difference between data and evidence, gathering it, collecting it, organizing it, 
and then I think making sense of it. Making sense of it, I think, at a local level is really what's what's quite important. Uh, we can't necessarily, like you mentioned, we can't necessarily um, uh, uh, manage the kind of information that is now global to a certain extent, but we can certainly make sense of the messaging that really re resonates, I think, at a local level. We'll hear quite a bit more uh, of that over the next few minutes uh, as well. Um, and I think it's also a good segue to, to Morton because uh, a, a lot of the discussion around hate speech and um, uh, uh, incitement and violence, and misinformation over the past year and a half particularly has come out of the COVID, COVID response, COVID crisis, um, et cetera. Um, uh, we, we have been speaking about it in the, inside the UN system about how there are particular voids that have been left that are being filled by other things. And I think it's important to get a sense of in this, in the context of Oslo 3 and the PVE discussion, um, how do you see some of these voids um, have been filled uh, in civic space, in, in this space um, of, of engagement uh, by violent extremist groups or others that are promoting messages that are not exactly the kinds of things that uh, we might have heard from Ahmed uh, so far, uh, also happening at local settings. Morten, over to you. Thank you, um, and um, thanks for the invitation, and thanks to my co-panelists for being um, a part of this. Um, let me start, uh, I think I would like to try to make four points uh, based on the challenge that uh, Samuel uh, gave me. And, First one is that I think we need to acknowledge that yes, COVID-19 and the pandemic and the attempts to deal with it, yes, that may have torn at uh, social trust, but uh, this come on the top of a social trust that has been diminishing for quite some time. So there is nothing new here. This has been happening over a decade or uh, so. So the, so the pandemic comes at a particular point in time where trust between people, but also trust between citizens and the state are historically quite low already before this happened. Secondly, I think we need to, if you talk about how various um, manifestations of violent extremism tries to take advantage of this. I think we need to sort of separate both geography uh, with regard to what geographical areas we are talking about. But we also think, I think, need to separate between the different effects that COVID-19 has had. And at least we need to separate between uh, what I call the direct effects, which are sort of more directly linked to health and mortality, and the indirect effects. And these manifest themselves quite differently um, around the world. For example, in the place where I uh, do most of my empirical work in the Sahel, I mean, uh, with regard to health and mortality effects, I mean, you don't really see very much of it. Uh, that could be because the, statistical, uh, le, the statistics are weak. But uh, anyway, I mean, one would have seen if there was an excess mor mortality in countries like Mali, Niger, and Burkina Faso, for example. That do not seem to be the case. But these countries are hard hit and will be continue to be hard hit by the indirect economic effects. And it may be that these are the, it's these indirect economic effects that also will be the most crucial to address because this could be the pathway for violent extremist groups to take advantage of. Because in these indirect effects means that people are losing jobs, markets are closed, they have um, direct livelihood effects in places where people already are very poor and are struggling for their livelihoods. So that I think it's important that we separate between these two uh, effects. Thirdly, I think we need to realize that when it comes to misinformation, when it comes to fake news, when it comes to alternative news uh, connected to the pandemic, uh, and that is probably the same whether this is sort of uh, messages that is being spread by or should we say, um, violent uh, extremist actors linked to um, religion, like uh, Salafi actors, or whether it comes from uh, more ethno-nationalist uh, right-wing groups, is that if it works for these groups, if it creates a potential for them to attach themselves to local communities, it is mainly because they are also able to address underlying grievances. 
And yes, local dialogue and local interventions can possibly pre prevent some of these and also prevent some misinformation, as we have seen in many cases in the Sahel, for example. I mean, the Sahel is, if we look at it um, on the uh, by sort of macro statistics, it's a perfect enabling environment for violent extremist groups. But still, I mean, if you look at what is happening, I mean, the majority of people are not joining these, uh, these kind of groups, even if the majority of people who live there has many and very good reasons for being angry, angry at the state, angry at the international community, angry at local governments and so on. But most people do not join. There is an immense level of local resilience there. And maybe we have, been, we have become within the whole PVE debate slightly obsessed with the occurrence of violent extremism and have looked less at what factors that already prevents local communities and local people from joining. Because there are so many cases that we can uh, point to where it simply hasn't been any intervention by an international actor uh, or a national actor. There is something else in the community that prevents people from joining violent extremist groups. And we have seen this also in a number of farmer herder conflicts, for example, in the Sahel. But we are also seeing that while local interventions, and I'm talking about very local interventions, while they can be extremely effective in creating reconciliation, creating dialogue and so on, they cannot stop these things from happening completely. Local dialogue can foster reconciliation, but really deal with the causes of conflict as the backbone of the turn to violent extremism. And the question and challenge to us is how can we empower these groups to also deal with some of these underlying causes of conflict that lies behind the turn of some people to violent extremism? And, the, and how can we do this lightly so that we don't become necessarily a part of this or part of the solution because that I think in many cases will be counterproductive. So the question is how to ensure a non-biased empowerment of these kind of groups so they be so they remain the local content and the local leadership and not, are not overrun by be it for actors from the from the national government or from the international community. Because after all, I do believe, and I'll end by this, uh, is that saying that, what is this all about? It's all about relevance. And if we are to succeed in our attempt to reduce the potential of violent extremist groups, hate speech, and so on and so forth, we need to also look at this from a livelihood pers perspective. And I think that livelihood perspective is as useful in the very poor areas as it could be elsewhere, also in the richer world, because the, most often there are underlying grievances that these groups are able to take advantage of. And it's, and it's there that there is a solution, it's there that it is. I'll stop there uh, and I look forward to listening to the rest of the discussion and maybe have the chance to come back. Thank you. Thanks very much, uh, uh, Martin. Martin, of course, is um, a research professor at the Norwegian Institute for International Affairs. Uh, Nupi, thanks very much for that. Uh, just to reiterate, I, I like how you started by saying not everything is COVID, not everything is violent extremism. And I think we need to look a little bit more distinctly at some of the root causes for um, for some of uh, uh, some of the work that needs to be done, and to be a little bit more discerning about where uh, where these roots come from, uh, maybe rather than going to Ruth, which I, I had intended to do, but uh, given your discussion about the Sahel and particular local intervention and their impact, uh, etc., it's actually a pretty good segue to uh, uh, Hamsatu Alamin. Uh, who is obviously the founder and executive director of Alamin Foundation for Peace and Development in Nigeria. I think, uh, I think Morton was specifically addressing you and looking for some insight into how, uh, at a local level, we are actually able to do this and do it effectively. And then once you finish your intervention, uh, then I think we'll go to Ruth uh, International Alert uh, and hear a little bit about, okay, so we do all of this, we have the analysis, we have the interventions, measuring impact becomes a slightly different uh, Thing and how do we do that now? How do we do it better? I think becomes a question. 
but uh, but um, Satu, uh, with a particular look at local and community intervention and how you engage local actors, CSOs, authorities, um, how do you look at addressing some of the underlying causes that lead or that offer this difficult pathway to violent extremism uh, in many particular cases, which I think have an underlying cause of just a simple lack of trust, uh, either in the future or in each other or in the authorities, uh, therefore driving grievances uh, and violence. How do you look at that? How do you try to respond to some of these issues? Over to you. Yeah. Thank you very much. Apologies for joining you a bit uh, later. In fact, there are some technical challenges here. Yes, I'm uh, rightly abused. Uh, in the context, I am operating here in northeastern Nigeria. In fact, there are some social and then social cultural um, uh, things as kind of interwoven that facilitated this kind of things. Particularly in our context, there is exclusion of more than 80% of the population that is women and youth. In our context, youth do not come near where elders are, even if decisions concerning them are being taken, because this is respect. And then for the woman man too, because of masculinity and others in our social context, the man does not communicate with his women, that is the wives. Hence, the peer is the relationship is that of rather fear more than respect. It is that of fear, I can say. So the youth becomes more aligned with the woman that is his mother, right from childhood up to his up to adolescence. So that when these youth become radicalized, the first beneficiaries of this radicalization are their mothers, who now become the first allies who now collaborate with these youths to hide their, uh, the radical youth's guns under their own beds and then benefit from the money that comes from the, with the gun. In fact, in certain communities, when the youth come, the day the youth come with the gun, all the women in that community will rally around the mother to celebrate that they have gotten guns because the, that gun come with the money, with money, while the father is completely cut off. So uh, violence extremism also at a point came, became the issue of identity and relevance in the community came into play in the context of Northeastern Nigeria. While these youth and the women are being sidelined and then neglected by the elders, when this, I'm um, the leader of the extremist group image, he is a youth, his followers are youth, and these young men are able to convince their mothers and then the younger girls in their house to idealize uh, uh, and then um, um, uh, sort of indoctrinate them with the ideology of Western or secular education is haram. Hence the young girl at the age of 13 to 12, 12 to 13 can now leave school while the brother now marries her up to his fellow radicalized man. And therefore this girl also now has gone with them. And then in the communities too, the communities where these extremists has, have heavily recruited, like Kormela, Gangamari, there are a couple of them, in fact. So in such communities, in fact, the other members of the larger community despise members from the, these communities, not only the radicalized youth, but including their mothers and then even their kids. The, uh, the women in those communities are being referred to as Boko Haram wives, and the children are also referred to as Boko Haram children. Hence, even enrollment into school become difficult to the children. And then even boarding, in fact, getting a taxi to convey these women to places, people will say, who will carry a Boko Haram wife? So since the community has despised them, what else would they do? But to join hands with the Boko Haram, and then as the security agents come to mismanage this community, these women become at the forefront of encouraging their younger ones to join the extremist group, or they themselves even joining so that they can take revenge from the excesses committed by the counter-terrorism operatives on these communities. So in fact, as, uh, uh, as deep, someone who is deeply rooted because in, the, uh, in our this thing, I, uh, philosophy as a member of the Women Alliance for Security Network, this, um, uh, we were given opportunities to demonstrate how women can actually um, uh, show leadership in countering some of these things. 
So the first thing we consider doing is a realignment of social norms and then reintegration in such communities. So that in fact, basically why do we do is that in, it did was the introduction of community dialogues. Then in this case, we have inter-community dial, inter-community, intra-community, and then dialogue with social providers. Because when we started this for the first time, the women and then the youth that are not communicating with the men, we brought them together to a mosque and then sit down to now start to brainstorm on some of these challenges that is facing their communities. It was only then that we see for the first time, men accusing their wives that they were in fact collaborators with the youth because Sorry. When have you even cared? When we really showed them that, yes, really, you see how you have neglected. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe you can turn your video off uh, because the bandwidth seemed to be uh, little and we lost you for a second. If you can still hear us. This all distance of communication and then relating Oh, oh, am I cut maybe, up? Yes, maybe if you can turn your video off, uh, then we can hear you better. We lost you there for a second, but otherwise I think it's okay. Okay. Thank you. Are you hearing me now? Yes, we, we can hear you Are now. Are you hearing me? Yeah. Okay. So so in this this kind of context, because yeah, then when we brought them together for the first time, men representative of men, women, and then the youth, to sit down in the mosque so that they can understand each other. It was then that the men really realized the mistake that they are making, that of neglecting the women and then the youth. And now the youth who have been neglected have now found relevance and importance as extremists. They are the leaders. And then the women joining them have now gotten relevance. Then that world well, we thought we are joining to change the world because the world has gone bad. So you see the kind of perception that the excluded youth and then the um, uh, uh, excluded women now imbibe and then found it as a motivating factor to join them. And then in the larger uh, and the larger society too, we now organize some um, dialogues with service providers, this time with authorities like the military or security agents themselves, in fact, with whom completely trust has been broken because of this insurgency. Even before the insurgency because of the institutionalized corruption where all systems have become ineffective and then there is system failure, people are have little respect or regards for authorities. So therefore, with the, uh, with the coming of the Boko Haram, at least now people, uh, especially in the downtown communities have gotten alternatives to authorities. So in this context now, we have to bring people for, uh, on the government side, that is the security sector representatives, community leaders, service providers. Some of them are state actors, some of them are non-state actors, so then they can sit together with members of these uh, communities. Because the communities themselves, even at the initial state, as I said earlier, they were even torn apart. Each family has grievances on one another. And then inter community, they have grievances with members of the other community. And then with the government, there is no communication, no trust. So when we became, when we brought the security agencies together with the service providers and these communities, to sit down in a dialogue where we, the civil society actors, became the, uh, media, uh, the moderators. With the little skills that we have, we are able to give the community members skills to dialogue, to listen, and then to assess, and then uh, uh, comprehend what the other person is saying. So that the idea now is to bring them together to understand what are the perspectives of these government authorities that now they now distrust and then completely don't want anything to do with. And then as now, we, uh, as, as we brought them together, it be became an opportunity, very rare opportunity for the state actors to now sit down with such members of these communities to educate them and then enlighten them on the programs of government and then 
uh, how they can respond to some early warning uh, um, issues which were brought, uh, his are too broad, they don't even know where to relay them to or even anybody to take them to. So uh, gradually, you are, uh, we were able to open up these communities to be in park, to be receptive, to, uh, to start listening to service providers, particularly government service providers. And then with the realignment of social norms, they themselves have gotten now new uh, self-realization. And then uh, I kind of, um, uh, we have also opened up a ray of hope, in fact, a ray of hope and then few aspiration for a better future than the future of being, in fact, everybody, where everybody's child and then everybody's siblings become extremists to the extent of even dragging their own mothers and then other siblings in the family to join the extremist group. So, uh, in fact, this community dialogue that we all, in fact, we continued um, uh, after, um, in fact, the first organization to ever uh, assist us to convene such community dialogues with the International Civil Society Action Network. In fact, that through them, I am able to come to the Oslo Forum two times, and this is my third time. So in fact, with the little capacities that were, were, were given to us, we are now able to, in fact, change the whole perspective in the context of the Northeastern Nigeria. Because in fact, initially, even I myself, I'm sort of that is talking to you, I, I the, uh, the people I hear most, or have reservation most in the community is the government actors, particularly the security forces and others. I don't trust them. And I, I even blatantly said it because even I myself have been arrested. And then I have seen where several innocent people and then their children have been arrested. And then some of them have remained disappeared forever. And now in fact, this has led to the radicalization or joining the radical groups of many families in the context of the Northeastern Nigeria. So therefore, the best I can do, I feel, is how can I bring these actors to really understand each other so that to really get the perspective of one another so that we can now understand ourselves better. And then in this context too, my, uh, our community dialogue initiative has some, uh, we did not relent. We now extended it to, uh, to bring in our Christian, uh, fellow Christian women based, based organization too. Because the, uh, this uh, extremist tendency have torn the Muslims and then the Christians apart completely. In fact, Muslim youth have been radicalized against their Christian um, uh, counterparts, while the Christian, the mistrust, and then the uh, whatever among the Christian youth towards the Muslim is some is uh, better, I can say, imagined than even actually uh, uh, seen or even assessed. So therefore, now we extended this kind of dialogue to our fellow to bringing uh, we brought together the women faith based organizations into our fall. And then the youth also, the faith-based organizations among the... Okay, maybe that's a natural break, uh, unless, I've, uh, unless I'm, I'm the one who's actually uh, stopped being... The, youth all, the only situation... Okay. Sorry, sorry, Good. sorry. Yes. No, 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 all thanks, thanks very much. And, uh, Go ahead. Okay, no, yes. thank, thank you very much, uh, yeah. Hamsatu. I think this is an opportunity maybe to take a little break here so that I offer an, an opportunity for, for Ruth, but maybe do another round also of, um, of consultation. Okay. I really value thank what you, you mentioned, especially on, on the issue of um, part of the problems that you are seeing in, uh, in Nigeria are no communication to communication, intergenerational gaps, um, uh, gender dynamics that actually are part of the problem rather than part of the solution, plus obviously the highly securitized uh, perspectives. I'm glad you mentioned these two things because at, at least on two of these uh, projects, Ruth knows those uh, quite well, but we know them quite well in the engagements that we've had with you on the research on invisible women or whether you know the what we know now from um, uh, journey to extremism research, or even uh, in the case from uh, from Asia as well, uh, extreme lives. And I think part of what uh, Ahmad had, had mentioned, I think, is reminiscent uh, quite a lot of that. So the effectiveness of all of this, uh, Ruth, our colleague from International Alert, obviously, and who's partnered with us on a number of different initiatives um, that talk about measurement uh, of PVE, especially the national action plans and uh, other areas. 
with a view of improving uh, the kind of work that we do. Uh, so we heard about the analysis and the evidence and the data. We heard about some of the resources. We heard about some of the interventions. Uh, the question is after three, four, five, six years of trying to link the analysis to the intervention, how do we actually know that we've actually had an impact in the work that we are doing? And how, do, um, how, how does a perspective on impact and monitoring and evaluation offer an opportunity to basically readjust uh, program uh, in light of many different things that are happening around us. Five or six or seven, eight years ago, everybody knew that, for instance, in the Sahel region, there was displacement happening, happening because of the socioeconomic conditions, governance conditions, even climate conditions. But it takes seven or eight years, maybe one or two years ago, and we're actually talking about climate security, for example, as part of um, the problem uh, that needs to be addressed. And the PVE team has actually done some research linking the climate security and the PVE perspective, obviously focusing uh, on that. But from some of what you've heard, uh, Ruth, uh, what's your sense of, of uh, taking a pause and looking at impact and what comes next? Thanks a lot, Sam, and, and thanks to my colleagues on the panel. I think a lot of what maybe I will reflect on from um, the experience of assessing um, a series of uh, prevention related interventions, both from a design and an impact perspective, will chime with um, a lot of what's already uh, come before. Um, so whilst every context is, is different, perceptions of community exclusion, uh, injustice, lack of trust in authorities, dissatisfaction with service provision, corruption and abuses um, have been cited as drivers for tension, um, as well as motivators for violence and joining armed groups. And given this centrality of trust deficits and creating safe and inclusive spaces to, to build relationships and trust both vertically and horizontally um, at the community level are important. However, there, there are challenges and, and what we've seen from looking at community-based interventions for um, violence prevention is that if not well designed and, and locally led, the impact of these can be mixed or even harmful, breaking the social capacity um, capital that these interventions seek uh, to build. So in thinking about that question of, of, of design and, and impact, I'd like to sort of think about some underpinning uh, questions. Uh, so what is the intervention for? Who is it with? How do we engage? And then ultimately, how do we measure um, success? So as, a port, as an important standpoint, it's, it's critical to have a shared understanding of the problem and what the goal is of uh, uh, the dialogue or, or local intervention. It's critical to have that clarity and consistency and transparency of communication around purpose of, of the intervention. As we've still seen quite a lot of confusion and perhaps a disconnect, particularly between uh, the local and national level on core concepts around PV interventions and, and the goals of those interventions. And communities themselves may prioritize and see these differently. Um, Therefore, having localized um, analysis that's regular and then linked to monitoring systems uh, is critical. Uh, analysis that maps those drivers and those pressures, but also critically those sources of, of resilience, those protective factors um, that are already existing within, commu within communities, whether they're uh, particular actors engaged in prevention or, or spaces uh, is important. And that that's actually developed with uh, the participational and led by um, communities themselves to give a real understanding of, of what that problem is. And this connects to the sort of the uh, question of uh, avoiding a risk and, and, the, and the potential of backlash and stigmatization of being engaged in prevention programs because that agenda is set by the communities uh, where those local interventions are happening. And then some lessons around who uh, that engagement is with. So thinking about uh, building social trust and, and dialogue, those processes need to strengthen the presence of a positive and supportive social networks, which have uh, demonstrated to be key in, um, in uh, protective factors for communities, particularly when it comes to bonding and bridging between and amongst communities, but also that critical factor around linking with um, authorities or decision makers 
Um, so that needs to be inclusive and wherever possible, engage the most disengaged. Now, this has been a kind of consistent challenge of prevention programming in terms of both identifying uh, who are the most hard to reach and then accessing. And this has only been really magnified with the move of, of working online and in the digital space. Uh, so uh, lessons where, where this has worked well is there's been some real investment up front in um, analysis of, of vulnerability, that that um, analysis and criteria is set with communities in engaging and in investing in relationships with um, CBOs and, and CSOs that have those connections within uh, communities, but also with a real mind of, of understanding where those sources of, of resilience are so as not to, to stigmatize those, those engaged. Um, and, and working in parallel where it's, there's a whole trust building process that needs to happen before engaging with um, authorities. Um, and then in terms of the how of engagement, um, those processes need to be connected to, to tangible outcomes and, and concrete actions and so not um, talking shops to avoid raising expectations, creating more tensions and, and ultimately potentially eroding that trust. And here critically is um, some, some of the gaps uh, that we've seen around um, linking up local and, and national uh, frameworks, ensuring that the funding is there for that follow on. Uh, process and that the timelines uh, can be critical. Often a delay um, can create uh, an expectation that therefore for isn't met. Um, so it's important that those timeframes match up and this comes back to you know a consistent challenge of uh, the fast pace of prevention programming and short funding cycles to the realities of dealing with a complex change. And so then to my last point which is the so, you know, how do we measure impact? It's, it's critical that those frameworks are able to capture both negative and positive impact, unintended and in, unintended. And so that can link back to, you know, regular monitoring of drivers, risks, and those protective factors at a local level linked with the, with the context analysis. And where that has worked well is that that's driven by um, those local actors directly uh, engaged and done in a way that's practical and not sort of too uh, uh, academic to, um, to say, but then linked with more kind of robust um, uh, research and data collection as well. Um, it's also important to break down um, what, what these issues look like uh, in practice, particularly when, when dealing with, with issues around social trust. It's a complex uh, issue and question and you need to break down into sort of tangible indicators of, of what that looks like based on the nature of the engagement, who you're engaging with and, and uh, the channels as well. And then the final sort of reflection on, on impact is that um, uh, there are so many other factors that may influence communities' overall trust in, in, in institutions. Uh, so issues of perceptions around exclusion, mistreatment, surveillance uh, and excessive or hard security measures are likely to um, influence participants' experience. So it's critical to have a framework which not only measures the intervention uh, directly in question, but also those dynamics around it. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Ruth. I think that is very interesting. And thanks also for sharing uh, a little bit, even though you didn't mention it, about some of the, the ways in which we understand the three SCs coming together, the social contract, social cohesion, and social capital. I think you explained that very well in the bridging, bonding, and linking word. We have a, we have a social guidance, social uh, cohesion guidance note that I think a lot of colleagues have also been, uh, are aware of and have been using, but, but we can share that with, with those. Uh, but I think one of the things that you reminded me of, and I'd like to go back to Ahmed for this, is a little bit on the, on the challenges of prevention, particularly on early warning. Uh, and I think this is this distant link between data and action. Uh, and I think part of what Ahmad was saying earlier on is to how to basically shrink the distance a little bit between data and evidence and analysis and getting that to the right kinds of messenger, messengers for action, locally speaking, who are able to do something with this. The challenge with data and evidence and even analysis was that some people just don't believe it. 
They believe that uh, early warning is alarmist in many cases, or it's not my job or it's someone else's job. But maybe in your experience, Ahmed, if you can share a little bit more about how to simplify uh, the analysis and the data to make it available to the hands of actors who are actually in the end uh, in the end effective at a local level. Um, if you can share a little bit of a perspective on that would be great. And I'd like to take another couple of minutes before we close in 10 minutes to also come back to, to Morton and, and Hamsato and maybe Ruth for another uh, round as well. Uh, Ahmed, over to you, maybe in the next couple of minutes. Yeah, thank you very much, Hassan. Uh, I would like to say that uh, there would be a shortcut um, just to simplify things. Uh, I think that the, the best way for us to, to, to do is just to, to have a baseline study to try to understand, first of all, what are the problems on the ground. And uh, in do doing so, we need to have a local asset to, to, to cooperate and to conduct the research as well. So the moment we have this data, I think it is much easier for us to plan and to craft the intervention programs. Uh, this is actually based on what I'm doing here in Malaysia. Uh, we need a baseline study. Baseline study is important in order to understand the nature of the problem and uh, who is the best messenger, what is the best narrative. And the moment we have all this data, then we can actually disseminate this information to the relevant authorities, the relevant parties and relevant actors. And then we can uh, work together to organize a certain program which is actually suitable with the right audience, with the right message and the right messengers. So that's my take, sir. thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I think that's a, that's a point well taken. We often think about local actors as implementing of other people's analysis and data and agenda and programming. And I think what you're saying is uh, the role of a local actor is as much an, an influencer and actor as it is being able to help provide basically good, um, uh, good analysis. I want to go back to, to Morton for just a second to ask a little bit more about what you heard from, from Hamsatu, obviously, on, on um, addressing some of the root causes uh, that both you and her have been able to see in different parts of the Sahel, particularly in, um, in Nigeria. If you were to look at, at the experience that you've had recently and try to help the PVE community, broadly speaking, identify maybe the most effective, the most at scale, the most, uh, the most under uh, explored opportunity in the different root causes, socioeconomic, security, political, cultural, religious, I think uh, Hamsatu also mentioned, where do you see that uh, in, uh, despite the last 10 years worth of programming, where is the part in the root causes that is still under addressed and that you would really um, help people, I think, marshal some efforts in that direction? Over to you. Thank you. Um, let me just uh, point to two um, issues that I still think we need to both get our heads around, but also to uh, to improve our uh, both attention and programming. To one is the issue of uh, land rights and a uh, farmer herder conflict. Because at least in the Sahel, they, they lie in the, behind so much of this. And we need to understand better also the changes that has ha happened in the local political economy, both with regard to uh, the fact that uh, changes in the transhumans and the, and the seasonal migration of cattle, but also how this impacts the, the local political economies around the cattle and farming. That is one thing. Here, there are still need, uh, things that needs to be done analytically, but there are also things that need, this needs to be pushed further up on the policy ladder, so to speak. And one needs to work intimately with local groups if or not to succeed there. And one needs to find a way of not bypassing the state, but making the state and the local state actors part of the solution and not as it very much is today, that they are rather a part of the problem. Secondly, an issue that has been looming particularly, but not exclusively in Mali, we see the same thing in uh, Burkina Faso, that's the issue of negotiations. And there are a number of local groups 
that uh, and st local stakeholders that are in favor of trying to open some sort of pathways towards negotiations. And here, I think it's a challenge to, uh, to UNDP, but also a challenge to, for example, the Root and International Alert. Uh, I remember back in the late 1990s, the, the role that International Alert played with regard to the conflict in Sierra Leone and uh, opening a pathway towards negotiations with the Revolutionary United Front in, in Sierra Leone. We could neg negotiate with, with the RUF of Sierra Leone during the Manu River uh, Basin Wars. Why is that impossible today when it comes to groups like the Katiba Masina and others in Mali and the Sahel? That, in fact, is art articulating something that at, look, at least looks like a potential political program as well. And I think we need to be very serious about how we can, how the international community and international community actors can contribute to these local debates that are now happening across the Sahel, particularly in Mali uh, and Burkina Faso, and not as it is, looks like, like right now, that many of these uh, local actors in favor of negotiations, at least in favor of trying, are looking at us as a barrier to that. And that is not helpful. It, I'm not necessarily certain that this will succeed, but it's worth uh, trying. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Morten. Very clear. I think these are two areas that are underexplored uh, uh, for sure. Um, and uh, there's a lot of stabilization type programming that is ongoing, and I think we, we might be able to do more. Uh, Hamsatu, yourself and Ruth have five minutes to split. So I'll try to do this in the next two minutes. One question to you, one question to Ruth. Um, but uh, a little bit of maybe a, not a controversial question, but a question back to you, Hamsatu, uh, based on everything that you are doing. And having, having done PVE pro programming for quite a while, effective uh, uh, as it is, my question to you is, what would you stop doing? What would you encourage the PVE community to basically stop doing, uh, uh, either because that kind of work is exhausted, already done, ineffective, uh, etc. And you must have had some of these experiences in your long experience as well in doing this kind of work um, uh, in Nigeria, but also in the region overall. So what would you stop? What would you stop doing? <laughs> Very interesting, really controversial question indeed. Yes, but you have, I think I stopped my camera anyway. So um, uh, as uh, you know, the PB wall is, uh, CVB wall, wall is now saturated or rather more focused on the kinetic military approaches. In fact, given the opportunity, that is one thing that I would like the whole CVB community to stop. Hundreds and of thousands of millions of dollars are being spent. And then in corrupt contexts, like the South World countries where we people operate, I think it is not helping matters. No war has ever started with the barrel of the, uh, the, uh, of the gun. And I believe that will never, no war will ever be stopped with the barrel of, of the gun too. And then in, in contexts like ours, when we, the ordinary women, without any mandate, without any power or authority in our hands, can be able to speak to the extremists with his gun and then be able to listen to us. And then we tell them, when we speak to them, they would stand and tell us, Mama, we are not going to listen to any man or any leader much as we are going to listen to you, the ordinary woman talking to us. Then I can see that really we, extremism can never be prevented or even uh, stopped with the barrel of the gun. So I would employ, especially the inter uh, international community, the do esteemed donors and others who are investing much money where they are not supposed to be invested, especially in contexts like ours where I can see all internationals coming and then a lot of resources being invested in security, in their welfare, in their communications, and there's everything with, I can say maybe as little as, or even less than 25% of those resources going to the people who are actually affected. And this is only generating a lot of grievances. And these grievances only God knows where it will end. Finally, maybe it will go and end in the, uh, at the end with the extremists. So it will rather radicalize people, it will rather frustrate people, and then many more will now, uh, will maybe with the end of Boko Haram, another extremist group, uh, group also will be born. 
And then because I can see now many followers, in fact, are being groomed to join. So this, in fact, given the opportunity, this is what I will tell the world to stop. In fact, if not stop completely, at least be reduced so that the real actors can be rich and then be impacted in so that their psyche, minds, hearts, and then the minds can be worn through other processes rather than by trying to crush everybody militarily and in the process generating more frustrations, more anger, and then more violence. Thank you very much, uh, Hamsatu. It might have been a controversial answer, but it's not a, con uh, a question, but it's not a controversial <laughs> answer. I think it is the appropriate answer, which I think goes along a lot of what we heard, which is the securitized mm. approach is, mm. not, is not helping. Uh, the question is, is there a more balanced approach? Are we missing a little bit uh, out on uh, uh, greater investments in development and livelihoods in research in a lot of local opportunities? Um, and how can we rebalance energy and investment of the international community in this and local actors? Um, one more minute to go, maybe to uh, uh, Ruth, uh, over to you. And I have one last uh, question. Are we measuring the right kinds of things? So for example, uh, are human rights considerations uh, being taken into account appropriately in a way that uh, you know, transforms the work that, that we do? The protection lens, the protective lens is coming up more and more. But I want your honest assessment of, are we really measuring the right kinds of things and are we learning lessons from that measurement to adjust programming, to adjust the lens, to adjust analysis? Over to you. Uh, you've given me uh, a very um, complex question to ans uh, answer in, in a minute, so I'll um, be very brief. I would say uh, yes and, and no to that. I think where we need probably to prioritize uh, focus is, is measuring um, those, those protective factors and investing in, um, as Morton said earlier, the, the existing um, processes uh, and uh, dynamics that are actually preventing people from engaging in violence, which is the vast majority of the experience. And also to refocus on those institutional and systematic uh, indicators that relate to uh, governance, uh, trust and, and measuring uh, abuses of, of institutions has been, uh, I think, an over-focus on individuals. Um, and we need to move more to the community and institutional level um, going forward. Thank you so much, very clear. A quick thanks to all the panelists and to everyone who joined us uh, listening or watching uh, online. Great thanks to the organizers and looking forward to, uh, to seeing you again in other panels and, uh, and please continue to follow Oslo 3. Thanks very much. Have a good morning, afternoon and evening wherever you are. Mm -hmm.